podcast for creatives, makers, doers, thinkers, who get their energy from within, who enjoy their time alone, and who are most creative when working solo. James Scully is a native Brooklynite, a total renaissance man, and founder of The Wall Breakers. More than a blog, it's a mission to help us discover how to live a life doing the things we're most passionate about. And for this episode of the Creative Introvert Podcast, I have the pleasure of talking to James about all things about being a multi-passionate creative, about old-time radio, and about the broken school system, amongst many other little mini rants from us. Without further ado, let's get on with the interview. Hey James, thanks so much for coming on the Creative Introvert. You're welcome. Um, Nice to speak with you. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, So I first came across Breaking Walls through my fellow Prince's Trust supported business owner, uh, Nigel of Mayamela. And Mm -hmm. now I'd like to turn the tables and have a go at grilling you. So first up, it's a bit of a selfish question, I will admit. Um, I'm going to be visiting New York next month and I want to know where I can get the best burger. Oh, well, there's a lot of good burgers in New York. One place that I would recommend would be on the west side in the borderline of Tribeca. Mm -hmm. It's called Bubby's. And the reason why I recommend that is because they're one of the few places that is authorized. I'm pretty sure this is the case. I could be wrong, but authorized to slaughter and cut up their own meat on the premises. Maybe not slaughter, (laughs) but they're not getting chopped meat brought in. They're making their chopped meat on the premises. And if you go into Bubby's, it has a very sort of Georgian federal style architecture inside, very, wow. you know, dining room type feel to it as if it's in your home. And uh, they have lots of custom teas. They're very much making their things under their roof. The prices are pretty, you know, New York affordable, yeah. AKA like everywhere else, but the food is definitely worth it. I would recommend Bubby's. Okay, good, cool, thank you. How's that for on the spot? That is very good. I was like, oh, you know, there are a few. Oh, you could go to Shake Shack. <laughs> um, no, I've no, never had Shake Shack. Fair enough, purist. Um, so, yeah, okay, now on to some serious stuff. So you've dabbled in a mixture of creative pursuits, am I right? Yes, that's very correct. And so what, do that, what does that range from? I know I've seen like a lot of your photography. I grew up in a house that had three generations of family in it. I liken it to a boarding house in a lot of ways. I had my great grandparents in my life into my 20s. Um, Because of that, I was very educated on what you'd call recent history, right? Let's say late 1800s through the 20th century type history, things that I was getting firsthand knowledge of from, say, my great grandmother growing up in lower Manhattan in the 1920s, 1930s, sitting around playing cards with her, just hearing about these things. I don't consider art to be a segmented thing. In a lot of ways, I consider math, art, and science to be all one and the same. You can basically get to a similar truth about life by using the three of them and combining them. So to make a long story short, when someone says something like, oh, you're artsy, I get very insulted at that (laughs) because I don't like that term for one. it's, It's a little bit derogatory to me. But I also believe that something as simple as cooking or I taught myself to cut hair when I was in high school because I wanted to give myself better haircuts than I was getting. These are all creative outlets in a way. As far as what you'd call traditional arts or what I went to school for, I went to college at Pratt Institute for graphic design. My major and my degree is in communications design. Um, I've been very fortunate through my career that because I have an interest in, let's say, writing, through the wall breakers, but also through some of my early career moments where I worked for a company called Daily Candy, which was essentially working with a bunch of editors, it made me a better writer. And sometimes there wasn't a copywriter around, so who was going to write the copy? Well, I'm the designer on this, so I might as well take a stab at the copy. And then you gain confidence over time. And one other thing about coming from New York, and I was joking with somebody yesterday about this, we're all storytellers and we're all communicators here in New York. So it seems to me that we're all very full of creative expression, whether or not we realize it. There's a lot around us at all times. So I'm shooting photography. I grew up listening because of my grandparents and great grandparents to the golden age of radio, which you and I have talked briefly about before, uh, which was, you know, in, in America, I, in, in, in the UK, it still exists because the BBC never shut down radio drama, but it did in America in 1962 radio drama went goodbye because of television. And basically because let's say CBS is owning a radio station and a television station, well, that's a lot of money to try to funnel equal you know, funds into both sides of that, so they moved all their funds to the new hot thing, which was television. I happen to grow up listening to radio drama. I love audio. I grew up listening to talk radio. 
I shoot photography, like I mentioned, video, audio, design. We're visual people, right? Mm. So a lot of ways, art is some sort of expression of who we are and, and what we're trying to get out of our soul and share with the world. And I've always just felt like it's limiting to me to choose any one medium to do that. Definitely. But that's just me personally. No, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm starting to realize now that I I'm really interested in different learning modalities. So whether we're audio, visual, kinesthetic, and that we're not necessarily just one of these. I remember at school, somebody saying like, I'm the, the one who draws stuff. Oh, I must be this really visual person, which it, it could be the case. Maybe that's my major one. But I've learned recently that I'm really very kinesthetic as well. And even the action of painting, that's not just a visual thing. It's incredibly kinesthetic because you're pushing paint around this physical, squidgy, movable object around a canvas. You know, it's feedback and it's all this communication. And you mentioned that idea about communication and it's one definition of creativity for me. I was just writing a bit about creativity and as soon as I use that word and I'm sort of already regretting calling myself the creative introvert because that's a difficult word. It, it is a bit of a nebulous term. I don't think we, I personally don't have a great solid definition for it yet. And I'm reading uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's book on creativity and I, I'm still none the wiser, you know? So for me, it's just, doing things that interest me that will spark new ideas and that could be in anything and I'm not sure what the next thing is going to be I never expected to get into writing myself in the way I have uh, or to enjoy podcasts for example so much to the point where I was like okay well I might as well try it myself and going back to what you were talking about with the golden age of radio and which I'm fascinated in and again it, it it's so different even though we yes the BBC it still exists even that has obviously changed in a massive way and the culture is very very different so for me when I was like tuning into all of these old-time American shows I was like wow this is just something a, a generation that has has missed it potentially so it's really cool that I feel like you're trying to keep that alive or at least um liven it up well actually I believe that it's coming back thanks to podcasts yeah and also if you look at in America network television meaning CBS ABC NBC Due to things like Netflix and Hulu producing their own shows, due to HBO's quality of programming, which tends to be either good to phenomenal, mm. broadcast television has taken a huge hit in America, especially that things are so radio-driven and everything's about the bottom line. If a show is not succeeding in 6 to 13 episodes, it's gone mm. So, because there's sponsorship relying on that. But because in the world of on-demand audio, a.k.a. podcasting, it's a little bit more of the Wild West right now. You're free to basically produce whatever you want, and if people tune in, that's fine. If people don't tune in and you're just making it for yourself, that's also fine. Mm -hmm. And I think because of that, you're seeing certain um, documentary-type shows like Serial that, while nonfiction, are told in a storytelling kind of way to keep people interested because we grow up – think of it, you're sitting – with your mother and father, one of the first memories most of us have is them reading something to us, right? It's a way that we're learning things and connecting with each other. Well, the beauty of, of audio, in a way, is that in some ways you can multitask because I can keep my eyes free mm. where I'm doing something else. Let's say I'm cooking, right? And then I have my earbuds in and I'm listening to uh, a show on something. Well, I can do both of those things at the same time. Now, there are certain times like I can't listen to an old-time radio show if I'm trying to decipher copy. It just can't be because it's, it's two of the same. Whereas if I'm like, let's say, masking something in Photoshop, I can do that because I'm just kind of mindlessly masking something and I can sort of tune out on that but tune in on what I'm listening to. Um, I think it's coming back to what I started to say because the production costs of producing a television show are much, much higher than it takes to produce a quality audio show. You just need the actors, you need the setting to record something in, you need good writing, which is the same right across the board already for television, right? But you don't need makeup because it's just audio. You don't need, you, all you need is a sound studio. You don't need to shoot on location if you don't really want to. You just have to put together the effects. And people were in such an on-the-go type of society. Vincent Price, famous actor. He was also a very, a very famous radio actor. It just so happened that um, he did an interview in the 1970s with a, a program called the Golden Age of Radio that was take on the, the Golden Age of Radio. But what it was was basically these guys interviewing former radio actors about their craft when these guys who were the radio actors were probably in their, anywhere from their 50s to 70s at that point in time. 
And it's good because all of those people that were being interviewed are dead now. But you can listen to these interviews with them from a time after they were recording on the air and get information about them. And Vincent Price, who at the time was living in L.A., was saying, I hate that they killed the radio drama because I sit in traffic all day. I would love to be able to listen to something if I'm on my way to go somewhere. It, it would be convenient. But you know, I, I interviewed recently a guy named Chuck Shaden, who is a very famous Chicago radio player from the latter part of the 20th century into the 21st century. And he said the main a few things. One thing is that when you're listening to audio, you're using your imagination as opposed to uh, video where you're looking at someone else's imagination, sometimes a conglomerate of different people's imagination. But you and I listening to the same play will have different pictures in our minds about how we perceive it to be, and that's beautiful because it's personal. And um, I don't really know where I'm going with this. Yeah, no, was, I'm planning on producing audio, and I love it. Basically. That is really fascinating. And a few things came up for me. I should have made notes because I'm going to forget them all. A, the idea that uh, <laughs> the idea that if Vincent Price was still alive, he would be really into podcasts. And my God, wouldn't that be cool? It would sound really spooky. And um, anyway, that was my own imagination getting carried away. But yeah, it's just talking about how like things change. So if TV killed the radio, are our phones killing TV? You know, I, I think I'm stealing this from Gary Vaynerchuk mentioned something like this the other day. Mm -hmm. And it's true, like, I'm pretty much getting everything from my phone now. Yes, I'm still using my laptop. I don't have a TV. I've no desire to have a TV. And I think I watched a whole movie yesterday on my phone just because I was in bed and I was like, I can't be bothered to get my laptop. And I didn't notice the difference. It's just this all-encompassing thing that we're getting everything from. And it's just really interesting to think about how technology is changing and, like, are we adapting to technology? I think it's just a really exciting time to be alive, I guess. Mm -hmm. It is. And so with The Wall Breakers, I know that you've been experimenting with different kind of formats for shows so where are you at with that right now because I think you're doing some really interesting things when I started breaking walls so and I'm sure you'll say this but for anybody listening at this moment I've been running an art collective called the wall breaker since February of 2012 it was originally the kind of site where it was basically desktop based because if you go back to 2012 desktop was still a main way that people got their visual information as opposed to mobile um, people would send me their work I would write about it the plan was always to write about things that I also enjoyed. I was working with a partner at the time, my friend Matt, uh, and also use it as a way to create things under an umbrella. You know, basically, instead of producing things, I'm James Scully, I'm putting this out, it's where the wall breakers, we're putting this out. Even that term, we are the wall breakers, as opposed to I am, gets people like, who's we? You know, if it's you, if they don't, you know, maybe they like my face, but if they don't, they're not going to care. Um, but as time went on, you know, there were other sites like Design Milk, Boom, This Is Colossal that were already established, already had giant audience, and then their audience have shrunk too. If you go to boom.com, uh, I can recall this, that if, if I was surfing boom.com in 2013, there would be like hundreds of comments on every single post that, this, that the guy put out. Whereas if you go there today, there's no comments on anything because nobody's commenting on these things because everybody's on their phone. Yeah, that's so interesting. I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but... I hadn't really thought about it just because I've stopped looking at them. I figured they were still going strong. But that idea that the conversation at least has died. Yes. Hmm. So, and, and understanding that, it's funny that you say the conversation has died. So in 2014, I had redeveloped the community of the wall breakers. And at the same time, I had wanted to put out a podcast. Calling it breaking walls is just because the wall breakers breaking walls. Uh, it makes sense. But, um, as far as an emotional tie-in to why it's called something like that, I wanted to sit down with people such as yourself when you and I sat a few months ago and we spoke about the creative introvert and we spoke about the things that you've gone through in your life that have gotten you to the point you are now. That's exactly what that was in the sense that you have a story to tell that I'm going to learn things from. So in some ways it's personal. I've done 50 something episodes and it's great because I'm a better human being for it because I've gotten all of these other people's experiences, some people I know better than others, etc. But if, if, as a listener, you can listen to this and, and maybe there's something similar going on in your life. Maybe you're at an impasse that you're looking for something to get past with. And I can think of the episode of, of your podcast that you put up, what, what to do when nothing else is working, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's something we've all experienced. I happen to have been going through a period in my life a few months ago 
where I felt like that. And listening to that episode of your podcast helped push me forward, helped break those walls in that sense. Breaking walls is not a visual of a, a guy swinging a sledgehammer at something. Well, that's a fun visual in a literal sense. What it wants to be or what I want it to be is getting past the emotional hurdles that we've all experienced in life, especially the present tense is continuously evolving and transforming into things that we don't know yet how to handle. So if we trust in ourselves, if we're willing to put ourselves out there and communicate with others, it goes back to that communication design thing, it'll help make it less scary because you and I were living 5,000 miles away from each other, but there are many more similarities than differences between the two of us and what we want out of life. So that's one form of podcasting that I've done, essentially a sit-down conversation centered around a helpful topic. Another one being on-the-scene type reporting, where it's a similar way of telling a story, but let's say uh, in December, I got the opportunity to listen to, at BAM, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, a beautiful piece of uh, art composition and music where people were blindfolded and listened to music and uh, had choreographed dancers touching them, feeding them things to the sounds of the music. I got to sit there and observe that without a blindfold on and basically interviewed the person who was throwing the event and somebody who experienced the event and pieced it together uh, in an emotional way. I must say like that was really amazing to listen to and just hearing it felt like I was there because again you weren't experiencing it directly so it's like the audience was on your side like for me I was like well I'm not there either but you're recording that for us and even hearing like the background noise that was very cool. Sound design is a beautiful thing. Yeah. It really is and it's something that I guess I was always interested in uh, in listening to radio and things like that and, and, you know, everything from a Howard Stern type talk jock radio to oldies music or, or current music to old time radio, golden age, like we were talking about. How do you create a sound effect? They made the sound of somebody being decapitated by chopping a head of cabbage in half. That was how they did that. And it worked, you know, sound of somebody getting their head, head caved in throw a watermelon on the floor oh it worked <laughs> that would be such a fun job yeah and yeah it had to be a fun job right I, I mean just or and also a challenging but i feel like rewarding job i find that producing audio is the same way for me i did a piece in the lead up to the inauguration of president trump called we the people where i was essentially looking at the constitution and the declaration of independence and it was a message for unity basically telling people look no matter what side of the political fence you're on Please see that you and the people that you consider your you know, philosophical enemy want the exact same thing. You just think it's two different ways to approach getting there. Now, that's okay. Those who want to rape and pillage, they don't count in this analogy because they're going to be outliers and assholes no matter what, basically. It was important to me to produce something like that for several reasons. One, trying to bring people together. Two, to produce a piece of audio, basically. How do you write 30 minutes of audio and keep people interested in. And it's an ongoing process for me that I really appreciate and something that I find myself gravitating to more and more because I just mentioned three different formats to an episode of Breaking Walls. It's a way to keep people interested too. So it's not just always a sit down conversation. We can mix it up a little bit. And I think that's what I really appreciate this whole idea of just not necessarily following suit from what everyone else is doing. It's something that when I started this, I was like, I'm just going to try to stay open minded and experimental when it comes to structure. And that was partly inspired by Breaking Walls because I was thinking it doesn't have to be just an interview show. It doesn't have to just be a solo show. And really thinking about what I enjoyed, because if I like it, I'm going to assume there's going to be somebody else there who likes this thing. And this idea of stitching parts together. So like one of my favorite shows was the one you did for New Year's. And it was just this amazing stitching together of different snip. So like, it, it, but it sounded very time consuming to go through all of this audio, but you like it. <laughs> you enjoy I, I do like it. Yeah, I would say that, that my least favorite part of producing audio would be editing audio. Sure. Um, that tends to be more uh, along the lines of when you're interviewing some people and they're like, well, I said, I said, I said, I said to him and, you're, and you have to go in and like cut out all the stutters, basically. <laughs> That's the only frustrating part. As far as that went, yeah, so that's another kind of audio that I've been producing. I want to do a sub-series once a month on Breaking Walls called The Radio Chronicles because the golden age of radio and the history of audio is so much of it has been transcribed and is available to the general audience if you go and you know where to look 
and you know what you're looking for, you can find anything. So that was an episode that I did on the history of uh, New Year's Eve on the golden age of radio, yeah. basically. And another one that I did the month before was looking at after December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor Day. So on the 75th anniversary, producing a show that basically went back in time to the earliest moment where it's announced that the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and Manila in the Philippines through the week, basically piecing together how the, the nation was feeling based on this audio. Now, we can go into it and say, well, you know, did the American, you know, hierarchical power have a knowledge of it beforehand and need to get it, blah, blah, blah. I didn't want to go into that, you know, political part of it. I just wanted to look at the history of it because it was available to us and tell a story that way that, you know, I think we can all appreciate because we're all human beings and we can emotionally become invested in what our great grandparents were feeling at that point in time. Yeah, that's what I got from that. There wasn't this agenda behind it. It, it felt like this piece of reporting and it almost felt like if I was there at the time, this is all the stuff I'd be listening to. It wasn't just the news reports. It was also some of the music, which I adored. And the was it like there was like a comedy sketch or something in there. But some oh, kind yeah. of like, and that was amazing. I'd never heard anything like it. So yeah, really awesome. Also just wondering just how you kind of do all this stuff and hold down a full-time job. Well, right now I don't have a full-time job. <laughs> okay. You did, you had been podcasting before with it. Yes, I had been producing audio while having a full-time job. Uh, I would say, and this is my personal experience, at times running the Wall Breakers the last five years has hurt my career because it's been more of a focus than what I was doing every day for a living. I think the antidote to making that not an issue is to do something every day for a living that you actually want to do, mm. whether that be the ball breakers or producing audio for another, you know, I, I want to be on radio. That's something I want to do. I want to be in broadcasting. So I, I want to volunteer at a radio station. Being there every day feels good. Making banner ads, I've been there, I've done that. I don't want to do it. So it really wasn't holding my attention the way I would have liked it to be, and that definitely hurt at least my pocket, my, my pocketbook, basically. It can be very time-consuming. Um, my social life, I look at my, now I'm 30 years old, so I have a five-year experience, basically 20 to 25, where I wasn't in school anymore, basically, for most of that time, and I wasn't running the wall breakers, and 25 to 30, where I was doing the wall breakers, and I was an adult at the same time. My social life is very different now than it was back then. There's less time at the bar. There's less just general hanging out with friends. I have to try to plan things a little more, which can be frustrating. And it's good in a way because then, you know, I have to learn how to push and pull and relax. And, oh, if I only produce two episodes this month instead of three, so the F what? You know, like we'll move on and we'll figure something out. Um, when I am holding down a full-time job, which is something that I want to do again uh, because it's nice to have a steady paycheck. It's just planning, you know, a lot of, there's, I think it's also mental perspective. I can recall a specific moment in time six months or so ago when, and I don't know how it is, well, you're working from home, but uh, as an example, there's lots of people in New York City that hate their jobs, and they're the people who are running to catch the Uptown Bound Express train as they transfer to the local. They're miserable, but they're running to catch that train to make sure they're there on time. I've always struggled with that because I look on the outside of that and I say to myself, but what's the, why? Why are you doing all this? I, I don't see if you hate it, why just keep doing it because you think you're supposed to? Um, with that being said, it's very easy to get into that mindset that there's never enough time. There's not enough time to do this. I, I don't have time to do all this right now. And there was, I remember this moment in time, six to eight months ago, I was in a, a, a grocery store after work one night. It was the summertime. And I think I was getting some, you know, deli meat, basically, to eat a quick dinner because I wanted to work out. And for some reason, my perspective changed in that moment from, I hope I have enough time to work out to, like, essentially meaning that I have three to four hours of time to myself in the evening when I get home before I need to be in bed, if I want to get a good night's sleep to get up and do it again the next day. And I suddenly realized that I have all the time in the world. I have three to four hours to work out for, like, 35 minutes and eat dinner for 30 minutes. How... It's just your mental approach. Like if, if I'm, you can be miserable or you can be not miserable, and that is essentially the basis to much of people's personal happiness in life. Just the perspective on how we look at it. It's something I've struggled with. I, I'm a fiery guy. I live near the water because it helps balance me. To that, you know, I find that 
I get claustrophobic pretty easily. I, I don't know that I'm an introvert or not, but I know that I get emotionally tired from being out around people for too long and I need to go home then because I absorb a lot of what's around me. Mm -hmm. So at some point I'm then full of, you know, my gas tank is full and I'm like Irish goodbye. I'm out of this, you know, <laughs> basically. So I guess to answer your question, making a long story even longer, it's an ongoing process that's called life. <laughs> you know? uh, what I get from that is it's up to us. It's, it doesn't have to be an excuse. Whether it's, you know, complaining about your bus or complaining about the commute, I do get that, especially something that I can't say that I've had to deal with is just like having to support a family. Like I get that there are a lot of sacrifices involved in that. Um, yes. But when it comes down to the majority of the people I'm talking to, people in their late 20s, early 30s, is that we're still trying to wrap our heads around the idea that we have a choice. And um, that decision isn't, I can either complain about this or not, which I think is, is a cho choice as well. But also just, can I do something about this? Can I do something on the side? And, you know, you can and always. Not, yeah, yeah. And it's, I'm really a big believer on, I think it's Parkinson's law that says, you know, you'll fit what you've got to do into the time you have. Uh, and I'm definitely, I've done that thing myself of being like, oh, I've only got like an hour. So I should probably just not bother even trying to write half a half an hour's worth of work because I don't have enough time. And it's it's just a perception. So yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. But something that I've started realizing is that, yes, having that kind of consistent paycheck, and it's quite hard to get from one job because then we sort of like feel a bit tied down. I can get a bit bored. And you're also locked into a certain dollar amount. Like this is all you can earn. Yeah. This is your personal worth. Exactly. And that is, um, yeah, it doesn't feel so good. So what I'm really interested in is having this kind of portfolio career where you are doing a lot of things and embracing that. I felt guilty for a long time that I wasn't doing just this one focused thing. And I talk a lot about, you know, picking one thing or don't pick one thing. Right. But more recently, I'm really starting to embrace the idea of doing a mixture of things. And, you know, even at the sort of lower end of the spectrum, that might be taking some work on Upwork or Fiverr or something, but also just in order to kind of like get this base rate going. And then after that, shoot for the more exciting jobs and then have the passion projects as well and just having a mixture. And that way it keeps things interesting. It does. And it'll inform each thing will inform each other. Ah, oh, so much so. And that's why I think it's really great that you've kind of made this thing work where you've got your audio stuff and yeah, it's like having this nice little boiling pot. Well, if you also think about it, you can only take on so many things by yourself. And this is something that I'm learning mm -hmm. the long way. You've got to rely on other people. That You've got to trust somebody. And in some ways, it's like this. If you, Kat, introduce me to a third person, I have to trust that I'm going to like this third person because I trust you. Mm. So I trust you and you trust that person, therefore I can trust that person. It's like A equals B, it's, it's, it's some sort of algorithm to make life better in a lot of ways because there's only so much that we can do on our own, right? Mm. So I wanna be involved in 10 projects, but I can't spearhead 10 projects. I can spearhead three projects, but I can be involved in various other degrees in other projects, and I've gotta be around people who also wanna spearhead things. If you're sitting around couch potatoes all day, you're probably going to be unhappy or a couch potato yourself. But so it is the company we keep. And it's also, I think, trusting ourselves. And also it's, you know, they say like dieting, the 80-20 rule, right? If you eat healthy 80% of the time, 20% of the time you can pick out. I think probably, and this is some, this is a revelation I'm coming to right now. <laughs> um, if you are productive 80% of the time, you won't feel guilty that 20% of the time you want to smoke a joint and not do anything with yourself because you've earned that right. You, yes. I, I need to sit here and I need to chill because tomorrow I'm going to be refreshed because of it. So you can't just be on all the time, which is something about New York City. You can even see it in the way that I'm talking right now. I have one cup of coffee today. I sound like I've had 16 because that's New York City life where you're just like, go, 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 go. And it informs the way we do business too because now – in because everybody has a mobile phone and everybody's got a computer and everybody's got a tablet, you know, you're getting changes to documents deep into the evening. Like, get the, get the F yeah. out of here. Enough with it. It's 9 o'clock at night. I don't care about the meeting tomorrow morning. Right. I need to sleep right now, you know? So I think we need to reconfigure ourselves. I, I think that's really important. Since moving from London to the sea myself, like Brighton, oh my God, like the pace of life has changed i haven't <laughs> i think it's affecting me slightly but um 
it's definitely strange being in a place that feels like there is no rush so I can respect that it's it's not fun and I, I feel like that 20% though is vital it's not like you can get by it's actually necessary and I've been trying to teach myself to make that space because when you do it's like everything else gets better when you allow that yes that time yeah I think also because when you stop and breathe for a second it allows you to process things that you can't process on the go it's a form of meditation and I meditate but also I think taking a walk amongst nature first of all as artists that's incredibly important but in general as a human being we live in a world you know and also the thing about the business part and maybe I get myself in trouble for saying this if you're splitting the atom please email me at 9 p.m. <laughs> if you want banner ads due tomorrow at noon, I don't give an F about that shit. I'm sorry. It's not important because it's shelf life is like three minutes and nobody cares. And nobody cares. And if you can admit that, and that's a problem in business. Like we're doing a lot of things in business that really don't mean anything. And that's a yeah. whole corporate conversation, blah, 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 that is for another day. But I think if we're doing things that have more meaning, we have more attention and energy for them as well. If we, human beings instinctively know the truth. Even if yeah. we won't admit it to ourselves, if we know something is full of shit, it's like I struggle in bars, right? Because there's something for me about being in a bar where I say to myself, why am I in here drinking poison right now, basically? Is it because I'm trying to be a better socializer? Like, this is fake. This is all fake. Absolutely. I do the same. Yeah, it, it's, it's exactly that. And I think if you were doing something so important, you wouldn't have to be emailing your employees to remind them to do the thing that they can't be asked to do. You know, exactly. in that kind of team, everyone is pulling their weight because it's an important thing and it means a lot to everyone. So, yeah, it, it's really interesting. And I think however businesses grow and like as much as I love being a solopreneur on this, I do think that at some point working with a team, it's a whole job in itself, just trying to find the right people and making sure that that culture that you create is is balanced, I guess, that there isn't anyone thinking, I uh, can't believe I'm working for this twat, <laughs> you know? Well, what you, what you said earlier about, we, we, were, we kind of started to hit on it, our education system in developed countries, yours and mine growing up is probably relatively similar. From you know four years old to, let's say, 17 or 18, you, until you go to a university or college, it's pretty standardized with de various deviations and things like that. And then you go to college, and it becomes a little bit more personal. And then, But then you go out into the work world. And basically from the time we're four years old till we're 21 or so, growth has been structured into our lives. But after that... And it takes – some people lower on us and some people never get it. It took me a few years to realize this. We're now responsible for our own continued self-education. There are – the majority of people in this world that are working are not doing whatever their true innate soul calling is or whatever. They're doing whatever they feel like they're supposed to do. It's not 90 percent, but it's definitely more than 50 percent. Mm -hmm. And if we can stop telling people that they're supposed to be something that deep down they don't want to be – Everybody, like, it, everything will just loosen up a little bit. I, I feel partly that the struggle, and I, I can't speak for the, the UK, in America, and New York is the extreme version of everything that goes on in America. I'm looking at it, and I'm nobody's friend politically right now because I consider myself a centrist, which nobody wants to hear that shit. You're talking about unity? No, pick a side. You know, like, if you look at what's going on you have younger or just in general progressive people understanding that we've been waiting through muck for the last 10 years since 2008 i graduated college in 2008 my entire career has been in a recession i've had health insurance for two of the last nine years i can't get a physical but i'm also being taxed because i don't have obamacare so that that's obviously that all sounds silly not to get into that but if you're looking at the structure of of the way things are going you have certain people that are looking to move society ahead because they realize that whatever's been going on right now, it's not working anymore because things stop working after a while. You pivot. That's life. But then you have the other people who are so afraid of the unknown that they're desperately holding on to the things that they think they need in their lives, the things that they've essentially decided to place value in, and it's creating a conflict that right now has no solution to it. it it's, it's going to go one way or another. Either there's going to be a harmonious end to it or there's going to be another kind of end to it but eventually it's going to end because people need to have more purpose in life i believe this is a rant a little bit and a little bit of a ramble 
No, I think it's timely. And I think um, it, it's kind of a realisation that I've only been recently having myself is that no one's going to turn around and give me a grade or an award and say, OK, you're ready to move up to the next level now, like we, they did at school. You can't just like hit all the marks and which, you know, I definitely was that kid. I just thought study well and my working life will be just as easy. And it's just so not the case. And and it's a good thing in many ways because now the ball is in our court and I don't think people are willing to admit that and take responsibility for their own happiness and I know that sounds easier said than done but I do think that's available to a lot more people than they're willing to admit. Yes absolutely a few things and I know we're running over (laughs) on time already what you're just saying about people essentially not willing to look in the mirror and look at themselves and say you're in charge here I think the reason why people are afraid to do that is because if they do that, they assume that they're alone in this undertaking, and now it's all on their shoulders. That's not true. We're all in this together. Mm -hmm. I believe that we are our brothers and sisters keepers. That has at times burned me because, uh, you know, I wouldn't say I'm naive at all, but I know when I'm going into something that there's a chance that somebody could essentially not have the courage to stand with me. That's okay. That's going to happen, and I forgive, and we move on. I've done that myself. But so people are afraid to do that because they think it's all on them. No, it's not. We're all in this together. That's why we have to communicate with each other. The other thing when you were saying earlier about one thing and yes, there's a, pick one thing. You got to pick one thing. Well, if we go through school learning multiple subjects and all these things for 20 years, then I'm supposed to do one thing for the rest of my life. I'm an artist. I got bored with graphic design like three years after college because I didn't want to just do graphic design production work for the rest of my life. Like, no, that's not. At some point, it ceases to be creative and it becomes essentially like a hamster on a wheel. Yes. And no human mind is built for that. Yeah. And it's just not getting the best out of us. Oh, God. Well, I could just talk to you forever, um, but you have to come back on, basically. We'll have a part two. Sure. Well, <laughs> do you want to like end on something lighter? So people know I feel that, like you know, that. Well, I like steak dinners and I'm a normal human being as well. <laughs> and I'm not always ranting and raving. Where can people find you online and find all this awesome, exciting radio stuff that's happening? They can find me online. You can go to thewallbreakers.com. Uh, right now, thewallbreakers.com is essentially just a desktop site. I need to do something about that. But I'm on so- all forms of social media at The Wallbreakers. That's T-H-E-W-A-L-L-B-R-E-A-K-E-R-S. And that's everything from SoundCloud to you know Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, etc. I'll be putting lots of links in the show notes. So cool. we'll have that. Cool. Well, thank you so much for chatting. Absolutely. Thank you.